Hi, Debbie. How are you, Tushay? Uh, How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Dr. David. Good morning, Joel. Which are you seeing the which window? Because I I've not usually used Teams. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation or the slideshow windows? Uh, yes. Uh, but there's another screen uh, cover the, your slide. Huh. All right. Let me figure something else out. Uh, how about that? Yeah, that's good. But there's uh, there's another small screen uh, huh. showing the next slide. Hmm. How about that? Yeah, that's good. Shoo. Okay. Thank you very much for keep supporting our our class. You know I will do anything to support you. Uh, <laughs> you were amazing as a postdoctoral visiting scholar, and you continue to do amazing things. So um, you have my Thank full you. support. So uh, maybe we we. Wait for uh, a few minutes to start. Of course, no, no rush.
Okay. Uh, good. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, I think good morning to uh, Professor Garman. Uh, I think uh, it's my great honor to introduce uh, Professor Garman uh, to give us a uh, special lecture today. He 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 is a uh, uh, well uh, well known scholar scholar in the neurofibromatosis research for I think more than thirty years. Uh, I am very happy to have chance to to learn from him from uh, the two thousand six to two thousand eight in his lab, and I learned a lot a lot of from from uh, Professor Gardman. Uh, so. Uh, I'm also very happy to to invite him to uh, continue to give us uh, the a special lecture to give us share his knowledge on the neurofibromatosis. Uh, I think this today uh, you will uh, learn uh, uh, a lot of things about the clinical features and uh, especially the the research. Uh, update in the neurofibromatosis. As a welcome, uh, Professor Gartman. Thank you very much, and uh, I'd love to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. So, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. So this um, becomes a good learning experience for you. So, I th think the first place to start is to define what the subject matter is. Uh, of our discussion today, and that is what is neurofibromatosis? It's actually a complex set of conditions um, that affect almost every organ system in the body. And children and adults with these neurofibromatosis syndromes uh, are at high risk for developing both benign and malignant cancers. There are at least three types of neurofibromatosis that, whose names have changed over the past couple of years, the most common of which is neurofibromatosis type 1, which will be the subject of our discussion today. That's a disorder that occurs in a few, uh, in about 28, 1 in 2,800 individuals worldwide, so just a little bit more frequently than 1 in 3,000 and uh, is caused by a germline mutation in the NF1 gene. We're going to go through all the clinical features, so I won't talk about them in this slide, but I'll mention the two other conditions that now are known as schwannomatosis type, NF type 2, and uh, schwannomatosis. Uh, schwannomatosis neurofibromatosis type 2 uh, is uh, also a cancer predisposition syndrome where individuals are at higher risk for developing meningiomas, ependymomas, and then the characteristic uh, tumor, the schwannoma, uh, often presenting as bilateral vestibular schwannomas. And then there's schwannomatosis, which uh, is characterized by uh, the development of multiple schwannomas in either peripheral nerves or along the spine, where the main problem not only is tumor growth, but pain. Uh, schwannomatosis NF2 is about, about 1 in 25,000 individuals and is caused by a mutation in the NF2 gene, whereas schwannomatosis uh, is far less common, probably under-recognized, and is caused by mutations in other genes, including the Smart B1 gene and the LZTR1 gene. But today we're going to focus uh, on NF1. So NF1 is an autosomal dominant disorder. So as I mentioned, it's pretty common. Almost everybody in clinical practice in neurology will see somebody with neurofibromatosis during their training or in their practice. Everybody with NF1 is, caught, is uh, found to have a mutation in the NF1 gene that's found in their germline, so a sample of blood will identify that mutation. 
And children are predisposed to learning disabilities, attention deficit, motor delays and autism, as well as bone, heart, sleep, and enteric nervous system abnormalities. But what scares most people is the fact that it's a cancer predisposition syndrome where individuals develop peripheral nerve sheath tumors called neurofibromas, central nervous system tumors, uh, predominantly gliomas, but also breast cancer, glomus tumors, pheochromocytoma, and malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. So what I'm going to do um, over the next hour or so is talk to you about how we make the diagnosis, uh, what the clinical features are and how we manage them, and to talk a little bit about our bedside to bench and back again approach here uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. So back in the 1980s, uh, the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke put together a consensus development conference where they brought together experts uh, in, uh, at that time, clinical experts in genetics uh, in, and in oncology to talk about how to develop uh, diagnostic criteria. And based on their experience, and without much objective data, they came up with seven features that uh, were sufficient for a diagnosis of NF1. And in order for you to be diagnosed, you needed to have at least two of these features, uh, and that was sufficient. So the features, and I'll go through them in a little bit more detail, are birthmarks called cafe au lait spots, of a particular size and number. So in folks after puberty, a centimeter and a half or larger, and before puberty, a half a centimeter um, uh, in diameter or larger. And you needed to have six or more of these spots. Another feature were freckling in skin folds, so in the axilla, in the armpits, and in the groin region, but also in women under the breasts or in people with adipose tissue folds uh, between the skin folds of the, of, of the uh, uh, redundant skin. In the eyes, uh, on the, especially on the iris, having these hamartomas um, called Lish nodules was another diagnostic feature. Harboring two or more cutaneous neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, the presence of an optic glioma, a particular bone abnormality, that is um, a deformity of the sphenoid wing, which is the lower portion of the orbit of the eye, or a long bone dysplasia, typically of the lower leg, but could also be the upper arm, and then a first degree relative with NF. And those consensus criteria uh, were very successful for many, many years until uh, we convened another con development conference um, in uh, around 2010, uh, and, and that group, uh, or 2020 rather, when that group uh, decided to revise the criteria, not by deleting anything, but by adding two more features. And the two features were these bright patchy nodules at the, on the, uh, the back of the eye on the, uh, on the choroid uh, that are usually detected uh, by ocular co uh, optical coherence tomography or uh, uh, near infrared reflectance. So almost, in, almost impossible to see um, at a bedside exam, but those choroidal abnormalities were added. And then because of the more widespread use of genetic testing, uh, they included having a germline mutation in the NF1 gene. But all of the rest of the criteria remained as is. So let's go through these criteria. So on the skin, 
Children with NF1 are often born with these cafe au lait macules. Um, they're in uh, Caucasian children. Uh, they look like uh, just slightly brown coffee with uh, milk uh, appearance. So uh, that are just a little bit darker uh, than the surrounding skin. These are not tumors. These are just uh, an expansion of the melanocytes in the skin. Uh, they can continue to grow uh, throughout the first several years of life, but people don't typically continue to get more cafe au lait spots into adulthood. The other features are skin fold freckling. So this is an unusual location to see freckles, so under the arms um, it, or in the groin area. And that is a, uh, a common feature uh, in, in uh, kids with NF1 as they get closer to 10 years of age. Lish nodules are these brown, slightly raised, uh, benign nodules on the iris uh, that are sometimes difficult to see on a bedside examination, uh, especially in folks who have dark colored eyes. But if you have a light colored iris, they're more easily detected. But the gold standard for detection is still going to be uh, an examination using a slit lamp uh, by an experienced ophthalmologist. What all of these features have in common is that they are not tumors. Uh, they don't have any tumor potential, so they're not going to evolve into tumors. And they really don't cause any concern to either the physician or the patient. Uh, in contrast, the tumors um, that uh, involve the nerve sheath are dermal or now called cutaneous neurofibromas. So these are benign tumors that grow either uh, outgrowths of the skin, so they almost look like tiny mushrooms growing from the skin. Uh, they can be under the skin as a subcutaneous nodule or in within the layer of the skin and feel almost as if there's uh, a depression in the skin where the tumors are. Uh, sometimes these tumors have a slight color to them, so they can be pinkish or violaceous in color, um, but these are benign tumors, especially the ones on the skin. They're always associated with a small nerve uh, twig, uh, but they are benign and do not transform into malignant tumors. In contrast, there's a more extensive tumor called a plexiform neurofibroma. These tumors involve multiple nerves, often nerve roots, and they can be associated with significant medical issues. Um, as they grow, they can affect the uh, structure of bones. They can erode uh, blood vessels to cause bleeding. They can cause the nerves to dysfunction. And in a small subset of individuals, can actually transform into true cancers called malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors that we'll chat about in a little bit. The most common uh, brain tumor or CNS tumor is the optic pathway glioma, or OPG. This is a tumor almost exclusively of young children, to, uh, and they uh, are usually detected when a child uh, undergoes uh, an annual vision exam, and the ophthalmologist uh, notes a decrease in, in visual acuity, which prompts an MRI scan. The other uh, cardinal feature of NF1, not uh, very common, but we'll certainly see if, if you um, have a larger practice, will be a sphenoid wing dysplasia. So what you're looking at is an absence uh, or a dysplasia of the lower part of the eye socket, and that can lead to displacement of the eye uh, and uh, blood, either blurred vision or double vision, 
uh, for the child. In addition, long bones like the uh, radius and ulna in the arm or the uh, tibia or fibula in the leg uh, can be deformed uh, and that can lead to uh, a premature break. And I'll show you a little bit about that when we talk about management. And then the last piece is having a first degree family relative. That's not a distant cousin. It has to be either a brother, sister, or mother, father um, as a first degree relative. In St. Louis, uh, the way that we manage these problems uh, is uh, using a team-based approach. And we focus our efforts on trying to identify what problems will develop uh, through comprehensive multidisciplinary screening on site. Uh, that allows us to identify problems early. We educate our families on what to expect and how we're going to manage them. And embedded in our practice is uh, research. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But we collect blood on most of our patients. And some, for some of our families, we will collect uh, blood for uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cell uh, production. And then others are involved in clinical studies. And the goal of all of this is uh, to detect problems early and uh, to provide the best available therapies in a prompt uh, and expeditious way. So the issue as a practicing physician is not necessarily in making the diagnosis of NF1 because it is a disorder of complete penetrance. If you um, inherit a, a mutant copy of the NF1 gene from dad or mom, you have the disorder. So it doesn't skip generations. Uh, the clinical features are pretty easy to identify. But really what's vexing for the families and for the physicians is this extreme clinical variability. It's a tremendously heterogeneous disorder, even within family members. So that means that an individual, for instance, a daughter of a father with NF1 may have either more mild symptoms, less affectation than the uh, father, or much more severe problems. Um, and that makes uh, our ability to predict what will happen for any given child quite challenging. In addition to what I'm going to tell you about, I just want to mention that there are other problems that uh, we think about when we see these young kids because they're at risk for developing at lower frequencies other kinds of true cancers. They can have sleep disturbances, seizures, hypertension from uh, problems that uh, are not typical in the general population, motor delays, autism. Uh, they can have narrowing of uh, the aqueduct that uh, allows for the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. They can have early onset puberty, quite serious scoliosis, and a malformation of the bones at the base of the uh, skull, leading to a Chiari malformation and some herniation of the cerebellar hemispheres. Adults with NF1 are also at risk for malignancy. I mentioned some of these. Uh, but also want to underscore that young uh, adults are also at risk for malignant glioma, so typically glioblastoma, breast cancer, pheochromocytoma, uh, at a much higher risk than what you'd see in the general population. Sleep disturbances, seizures, hypertension, uh, uh, just as it, we see in the kids, and reduced bone density uh, and reproductive difficulties. Genetic testing is pretty uh, commonplace these days. We use the reference lab at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. They've had decades of experience with uh, now thousands and thousands of patients. And uh, they're uh, the laboratory that uh, we send the vast majority uh, of our patients uh, who uh, we uh, want to get genetic testing for. 
So let's go through the clinical features and how we manage them. But I need to make the point that the management uh, is age dependent. So there's no one size fits all management strategy uh, for everybody with NF. Uh, in the first year of life, we focus on plexiform neurofibromas because these types of neurofibromas are often congenital. So the child is born with them, but they will continue to grow as the child grows. So identifying one early allows us to, um, to follow that tumor and intervene at an earlier point. We look for the bone abnormalities that I'll describe because we want to catch them while they're still able to be braced rather than uh, required uh, surgery. And then development is a major focus for us in that first year of life. After the first year, we focus on vision in addition to development. Uh, as they begin to develop uh, as young little people, uh, cognitive and behavior and motor skills are things that uh, come into focus for us. In the school age years, school performance, particularly in the United States, uh, when the first few grades are really about acquiring skills like reading and writing, but the uh, grades three through five uh, in elementary school are applying those, and that's where some of our children really struggle is that transition from acquiring the skills to implementing the skills they've, they've learned. Vision becomes a little bit less of an issue, but we still monitor until about 10. Behavior, motor skills, neurofibromas, um, and scoliosis. And then in the young, in the teenagers, school performance, reproductive counseling, but also uh, spending a little more time talking about social interaction problems um, because some of our kids will be on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, um, and may not perceive some of the social cues uh, that uh, their peers uh, will. We segment the practice as is true in most uh, large hospital settings between a pediatric focused group in our setting that's pediatric neurologists and adult neurologists and oncologists uh, on the adult side. And one of the issues that is true for a face that, that our families face true in all institutions is making that transition from pediatrics to adult medicine care. In the United States, that's an often an abrupt change where they have to be prepared for the autonomy that's required to navigate the adult system, uh, whereas the, met, the pediatric medical system um, is parent-based uh, and a lot more chaperoned uh, than in adults. And so we spend a lot of time in our adolescent young adult transition program in, I, in making sure that our kids acquire those skills that would allow them to uh, to thrive uh, in the um, adult medical care. We're fortunate to have adult practitioners and pediatric practitioners uh, at Washington University. We meet every other month to discuss the children that are going to be transitioning over to adult care, identify their concerns, swap visits, and make that transition fairly seamless. So in the first year of life, um, we focus on the bony abnormalities, as I mentioned. This is a, a CAT scan just and reconstruction, just showing how that orbit is malformed. It's hypoplastic, uh, and that's, uh, that can lead to uh, misalignment of the eyes. We also look very carefully at the bones. In particular, this is a, uh, the lower leg. This is the tibia. It, the curvature is quite... Uh, pronounced here. Uh, we want to catch those curvatures before the children start to walk and bear weight on those bones uh, because if we don't, when they start to walk, those 
uh, fragile bones will fracture and that will those will typically not heal without inter without internal fixation uh, surgery by an orthopedic surgeon you can also have bone cysts that can elite, can lead to um, deformities of the bone that we need to recognize early if we catch the curvatures before fracture the children can be externally braced uh, and their bones aligned in a way that allows them to get stronger and not require the surgery. So prompt recognition is key. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, will get plain x-rays if we suspect that there's any orthopedic uh, abnormality and refer them to uh, our orthopedic specialist for either external or internal bracing. The number of clinical trials have been sparse. There was one clinical trial uh, many years ago looking at bone morphogenic uh, factor two. That bone morphogenic protein trial was not uh, successful at improving bone healing. And currently, um, most of the orthopedic surgeons uh, continue uh, with their established practice and no other uh, medical uh, uh, additions. The plexiform neurofibromas are another concern in childhood. As I mentioned, they are benign Schwann cell tumors, so they're not malignant. They typically develop in early childhood and grow with the child, but they can affect the adjacent structures like bone or blood vessel or nerve. And not typically in young kids, but in uh, teenagers and young adults can transform into a malignant cancer. These tumors can occur anywhere in the body. This is an example of a little girl uh, who has a plexiform neurofibroma affecting her eyelid, but also her, her eye socket. You can see her eye socket is nearly filled up with tumor. Um, and that uh, not only obscures her vision and needed to be surgically corrected, um, but it, it can compress the eye and the flow of intraocular fluid leading to glaucoma. So it, uh, intraocular pressures need to be measured, um, and she needs to be monitored to make sure that her eyes uh, are aligned properly so, so her vision is, is good. They can occur internally. Here's a plexiform neurofibroma, and you can see uh, how it has this appearance, almost as if there are uh, grapes uh, that are stacked um, on top of each other. Uh, see erosion of the bones here. Uh, and this can cause spine instability or fracture, uh, sometimes even acutely, uh, without uh, a lot of warning. These are, would, as you can imagine, very difficult to remove. And so uh, we focus our care mostly on medical therapies. In addition to eroding the bone, they can stimulate the bone to grow. This is a young lady I took care of for many years who's right leg due to the plexiform neurofibroma was 10 centimeters longer than her left leg, making it nearly impossible for her to walk. Um, so she did have uh, some growth plate drillings to slow the growth of this leg, and she wore a sizable uh, shoe lift uh, on the left side so that she uh, was able to, to walk well. Tumors can be quite extensive. You can see how this one involves uh, most of the thigh and, and beyond the knee. Uh, they can involve the foot and cause a dissolution of the bones. Uh, and when they are removed, which uh, is not that typical, what you can see is highly thickened nerves and then tumor that's often uh, gelatinous around uh, the thickened nerves. If they occur in the neck, uh, they can compromise neurologic function. So we don't the, uh, we don't want a, a nerve that's coursing through here to be compressed uh, and cause Horner syndrome. We don't want the airway to be compromised. So uh, in these uh, kiddos, we'll often get pulmonary function tests or swallowing studies to make sure that the 
airway and the uh, esoph and the esophagus are functioning well. Regular exams are really the key. Uh, in some instances, we'll do surgical debulking and monitor for signs of malignant transformation. There are a number of clinical trials. Uh, in our place, Amy Armstrong is a pediatric oncologist, runs those trials um, over the years. There have been uh, drugs that uh, target uh, C-kit, like imatinib. Uh, there was a PEG interferon trial. There were rapamycin trials, receptor tyrosine kinase trials, and probably the most successful are the uh, MEK inhibitors, uh, culminating in uh, the FDA approving salumetinib uh, as a drug for plexiform neurofibromas uh, in kids uh, and adults with NF1. There are other generation MEK inhibitors that are in clinical trial uh, and more that I haven't listed here uh, to see whether or not uh, different flavors of the MEK inhibitors will be more uh, efficacious than cellumentin. In the one to five-year-old age group, uh, we need to continue to uh, concern ourselves with, with development and cognitive and behavioral motor skills, but also vision. And so among the, the problems that we will start to uh, see in these kids are specific learning disabilities, or difficulty with reading comprehension, uh, with multi-step multi math, um, and that impairs their school performance. About two-thirds of our kids will have sustained attention problems. They may not be hyperactive, um, and because of that may go uh, may, it may be under-recognized um, um, or, or the diagnosis may be delayed that they have attention deficit because they don't have those hyperactivities. They're just not able uh, to uh, have the kind of sustained attention necessary uh, to, to excel in the classroom. Uh, up until about a decade ago, uh, we referred to these uh, children as having Asperger's syndrome. Uh, because about a quarter of the children were actually on the autism spectrum. That autism spectrum looks very similar to the autism spectrum uh, in the general population, uh, with the minor exception that uh, boys and girls are pretty evenly affected in NF1 uh, relative to the general population. And then about half of the kids have gross motor delays, so they don't run as fast as their colleagues. They, they may fatigue early, um, and they just uh, are a little more clumsy uh, than their peers. The management is really prompt recognition, asking those questions, performing particular uh, screens. Uh, we, we will use uh, the uh, SRS2, which is a, a bedside uh, measure uh, tool for uh, autism in, uh, in the, our clinic. We'll also use the, er the Connors Early Be Childhood Development screen for, uh, for problems with uh, attention. Uh, and then if we recognize anything either based on our history or this testing, we'll send them for formal evaluation by our neuropsychologist. This will often prompt uh, an individualized education plan by the school district. Um, pediatricians can start stimulant medication uh, and behavior management when appropriate, and we'll often make referrals to uh, ancillary services like physical therapy for the gross motor delays, occupational therapy for things like handwriting and using scissors, and speech therapy for the articulation problems. They're referred to the Autism Center uh, here at WashU when we uh, think that the child is on the spectrum and would benefit from uh, some of the behavioral therapies. There have been a number of clinical trials. So Lovastatin was one of the first of the clinical trials, as was Simvastatin. Those uh, were not wildly successful. Ritalin was, uh, was used for kids with cognitive disabilities in NF1. You know, while it was very effective for the attention uh, 
deficits, not particularly useful for the cognitive problems. And then what's coming into play now are the MEK inhibitors, and we don't have any strong data to support or refute their use. Because vision is a concern, uh, vision loss in children with NF1 is almost always due to the presence of an optic pathway glioma. It's about 15 to 20 percent of the kids that we take care of, and the majority of these tumors occur in young kids, typically around four years of age, uh, but can arise even earlier. They can, the tumor can arise anywhere along the optic pathway, including the nerve, the chiasm, the tracts, the radiations, and while the tumors may be detected, it's uh, fewer than a third will be symptomatic, symptomatic meaning that they uh, have vision loss. If the tumor grows, it can result in optic nerve dysfunction, the most common being visual acuity loss uh, or hypothalamic dysfunction. Uh, over the years, we recognize there are a couple of prognostic features for, for losing vision. One is the development of an optic glioma in a young kid. Uh, if the tumor is located uh, uh, beyond the optic chiasm, so in the tracts or in the radiations, those, are, those kids uh, tend to have more vision loss than those uh, who have optic nerve only. And then females, in particular females with uh, the anterior optic pathway tumors are more likely to lose vision. We uh, strongly advocate age-appropriate annual ophthalmologic examines, examinations by an experienced ophthalmologist. We start that usually around eight to nine months of age, and there are different tools that we use for measuring visual acuity depending on the age of the child ranging from teller acuity cards to HOTV or Leia figure uh, cards all the way to the standard Snell and acuity. Um, <clears throat> each of those is really important to use in the right age group uh, so that we uh, use the most uh, age appropriate and sensitive way to detect vision loss. Um, if there's any doubt in, in by the ophthalmologist, and especially in a child who can't cooperate, you will often get ocular coherence tomography. Optical coherence tomography will allow you to see the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is a good indication of uh, vision loss in children. We always look for signs of precocious puberty. Uh, those are more typically associated with tumors in the chiasm or the hypothalamus but not always, so sometimes, tumor, sometimes these can, this problem can arise in a child who doesn't have uh, a chiasmal tumor. If we suspect that vision might be a compromised, we'll get an MRI scan. We don't get screening MRI scans because they don't tend to be predictive of what will happen next. The first-line therapy is, uh, to date right now, carboplatin and vincristine. It's a very effective uh, chemotherapy, mostly well tolerated by children. There's almost no role for surgery uh, unless the eye is completely blind and starting to atrophy. In that case, we really want to make sure that we remove that atrophic eye, mostly for cosmetic reasons. Radiation should not have much of a role because of the risk of malignancy from radiation in a tumor predisposition syndrome. The clinical trials over the years have started with uh, rapamycin analogs, uh, moved to uh, drugs that uh, worked on, uh, on the receptor tyrosine kinase or signaling pathways, and more currently are focused on MEK inhibitors, salumetinib, tre uh, trametinib, and others. Uh, based on some strong preclinical data. In the 6 to 10 age group, we add on school performance, uh, continue to monitor for scoliosis, but also uh, for the appearance of tumors in other regions of the brain. Scoliosis in NF1 is most commonly just the typical 
slight curvature in, uh, that you see in the general population, but a small subset of kids will have a dystrophic scoliosis with fair, fairly pronounced curvature. Uh, this causes them to be significantly shorter, uh, uh, but also short stature can be um, a feature of NF1, even in the absence of scoliosis. Scoliosis is uh, requires medical intervention, um, and surgery is the uh, preferred way to straighten out this pronounced curvature. Uh, it's usually a two-stage procedure um, with uh, rods that can be continued, uh, we expanded over time. The tumor that we start to see in the brain uh, in, in, in kids as they get closer to nine or 10 years of age are brainstem gliomas. The median age is uh, around seven, which is older than the four-year-old uh, mean age for optic pathway gliomas. The vast majority of these kids do very well they do well in particular if the tumor um, is causing hydrocephalus and, and the, in that case uh, fixing the hydrocephalus uh, but not, ne not treating the tumor uh, leads to excellent outcomes. Oftentimes a referring physician will get an MRI scan and on that MRI scan they will see uh, small focal areas of single intensity that used to be called unidentified bright objects, now called focal areas of single intensity. These are seen in the vast majority of kids uh, with NF1. They're in particular regions of the brain, although not exclusively, but more commonly in the cerebellum, temporal lobes, the thalamus, and are often bilateral, which is not typical for a tumor. Their borders are not necessarily discrete like a tumor might be. And in contrast to a tumor, they don't distort the surrounding architecture of the brain. If you uh, include T1 sequences in your MRI imaging, uh, they are not hypo intense uh, on T1 and they don't have contrast enhancement. These features here uh, architectural distortion, T1 hypointensity and contrast enhancement are the kinds of things we see with tumors. These T2 uh, hyperintensities will fade over time and, pro and are likely of no real clinical significance. There are other uh, brain tumors that can occur in NF1 uh, and as many as 60% of kids on imaging studies will have these kinds of tumors. They have not been studied extensively. Uh, many of them will be uh, in the globus pallidus, the thalamic regions. They'll have the typical features of a tumor, but the minority, maybe 30% will require treatment. Most of these will be benign and will uh, not cause any medical problems for the, for the children. As kids enter into teenage years, uh, we uh, focus more on the cutaneous neurofibromas on education and transition to adulthood. The cutaneous neurofibromas, uh, similar to the plexiform neurofibroma, are benign Schwann cell tumors. We start to see them in late childhood, so some kids will start to have them in the first decade of life. But as uh, they go through puberty, sometimes even uh, the herald heralding the onset of puberty will develop these neurofibromas. The size and the number of these neurofibromas typically increase with age, but they do not transform into malignant tumors. Um, in cases where the child, young adult, uh, finds these uh, tumors to interfere with their activities of daily living, like they're uh, rubbing on a bra line or a belt line or bleeding or uh, in just interfering with writing and everyday activities, uh, they can be um, easily removed by an experienced plastic surgeon. The numbers uh, can range from being from just a dozen or, or fewer 
to hundreds or even thousands. And in the case of individuals who have thousands and thousands of neurofibromas, the treatment uh, becomes a lot more managing, um, a lot more challenging. Uh, sometimes the, the individuals who have these dermal or cutaneous neurofibromas will complain of itching. Uh, we can provide symptomatic relief. Conventional surgery, electrodesiccation uh, are uh, methods that have uh, been used successfully. Clinical trials have not been uh, very successful for these uh, cutaneous neurofibromas, but we hold out some hope that the topical application of MEK inhibitors might be uh, one medical approach for these uh, dermal or, plex or uh, uh, cutaneous neurofibromas. We always counsel our uh, teenagers uh, to call us or have their parents call us if a plexiform neurofibroma is now causing significant pain. So typically in the benign state, the children will say, we had all my Flexiform neurofibroma hurts when I bump it, somebody else runs into it, uh, but other than that, it doesn't bother me. The development of severe pain, change in the consistency of the tumor, going from soft and squishy to hard, rapid growth, or the development of a neurologic deficit uh, should prompt you know, an immediate phone call to their NF specialist because those are worrisome features of malignant transformation. When these tumors transform, they transform into a sarcoma called a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. These are very difficult to manage. They're resistant to many chemotherapies and radiation. They have a poor overall survival. And as many as 13% of individuals with NF1 over their lifetime will develop a plexal, well, I develop a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, typically from a pre-existing plexiform neurofibroma. The diagnosis of an MPNST is made typically by PET scan followed by biopsy. Uh, and then there's staging to make sure the tumor has not metastasized to the lung or the bone. Uh, a multi-specialist team is assembled. Uh, involved with um, oncologist pathology, radiation oncology, and, um, uh, and medical oncology uh, to provide wide surgical excision when appropriate, radiation when indicated, uh, chemotherapy, and enrollment uh, on clinical trials because there are many clinical trials um, that have been launched for malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors, and that is becoming the standard of care in most uh, major medical centers. At our center, though, the adult sarcoma program is uh, headed by uh, Angela Herbie, and she sees uh, all of these uh, kids and, put, uh, and young adults and puts them on clinical trials. So how do we go from the bedside to the bench and back again? And that's by asking questions that we cannot resolve in the clinic. So what do we not understand that could transform into research questions. At the NF Center here in St. Louis, we uh, apply multiple approaches to identify problems. And those are clinical studies, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, type discovery approaches to try to develop hypotheses for why particular problems might occur that we can use at we can use as hypotheses to explore in the research laboratory using experimental systems like genetically engineered mouse models or human induced pluripotent stem cell engineering whatever we discover in terms of mechanism uh, we'd like to be able to implement uh, in the uh, clinical trial arena, and, and we've seen many successful stories of identifying a problem, moving it into the fundamental basic science research laboratory uh, to lead to a discovery that now finds its way back in clinic. In an iterative fashion, we continue to learn 
uh, from our patients and learn from uh, our laboratory experiences. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples because I think they're uh, worth uh, illustrating uh, how, how important it is to have a scientific eye when you see uh, kids and adults with NF. Many years ago, uh, we had a discussion with our pediatric oncologists about how frequently optic gliomas uh, occur in boys and girls with NF1. And the oncologists would say, well, there are far uh, greater numbers of girls that we're treating with optic gliomas. And the pediatric neurologists would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. We have lots of boys and girls with optic gliomas. And that prompted this study where we looked at this about 100 kids um, to see what the prevalence of optic glioma was in, this, in our population. And it's pretty even between boys and girls, maybe a slight increase, but not statistically different. If you ask who's getting treated, girls by far three to five times more frequently are getting treated relative uh, to their male counterparts. And so how could this be the case? Why are girls getting treated? Well, the reason they're getting treated is they're losing vision. And so we repeated this particular study uh, with Michael Fisher, who uh, runs the uh, NF Clinical uh, Trials Consortium. And indeed, uh, girls are much more likely to lose vision if they have an optic nerve uh, tumor than are boys. To figure out why this might be the case, we took this uh, observation into the laboratory and looked at these genetically engineered mice that we had uh, generated uh, that develop optic gliomas. And if you compare the boy mice and the girl mice with these optic gliomas, the tumors grow at about the same rate shown here and are about the same size. So no real difference between boys and girls. But if you use a rodent equivalent test of visual acuity, the girls are losing vision as a result of their optic gliomas, whereas the boys are not. So this suggests a sex difference, even though they both of these uh, mice develop optic gliomas of the same size. To look at this more closely, we looked at the number of retinal ganglion cells. So those are the cells, the neurons that send their, their processes to the brain. And if you look, you know, boys have a slight decrease in the number of these retinal ganglion cells, but girls have about a 50% reduction. These are, again, mice with NF1 optic gliomas. If you use a measure that we frequently use in the clinic, which is measuring the thickness of the ganglion cell layer or the nerve fiber layer, you can see that the girl mice with optic gliomas have thinner ganglion cell layers and thinner nerve fiber layers. So this suggests that there is a difference between boys and girls. The most common difference between boys and girls would be sex hormones, and it suggests that estrogen might be a reason why the girls are losing vision. And in early studies, we show that if you chemically ablate the ovaries, uh, you can reduce the number of dying nerve cells in the retina and increase the number of living uh, retinal ganglion cells, or if you remove the ovary surgically, you can reduce the death of these retinal ganglion cells, increase the number, and increase the thickness of the nerve fiber layer. This is not a, uh, an approach that we could actually take into the clinic, and so that prompted us to try to figure out if there was a mechanism that we could uh, leverage uh, for um, future clinical study. One way would be to inhibit 
the estrogen receptor on the glial cells that are killing the neurons. And when we do that, we can, uh, we have about the same effect on the retinal ganglion cells and the retina and the nerve fiber layer, as we saw with removing the ovaries, which is that there's far less death of the retinal ganglion cells, increased numbers of those cells, and increased nerve fiber layer. So that suggested to us a potential neuroprotective strategy. So what Caroline uh, Tang did, who uh, was an MD, PhD, uh, postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, now directing her own laboratory at Washington University did, was she asked, well, could we repurpose a drug that we use to suppress the gonadal hormonal axis uh, in children who um, develop puberty at an early age? The agent that we use uh, in the clinic is Lupron, uh, and she asked if she treated mice with Lupron during tumor development, could she halt the loss of retinal ganglion cells and the nerve fiber layer thinning? Uh, and indeed, she could. In fact, she could restore the thickness of the nerve fiber layer pretty much to uh, levels that you see in wild type mice. And so this became uh, an opportunity for her to refine her treatment, which she's doing now, with the hope of providing an oper a, a therapeutic opportunity to attenuate vision loss uh, and progression in children, uh, particularly girls with NF1 optic glioma. Another question that we struggled with is why do children have developmental delays in autism. And this is particularly problematic because when you look at the brains of people or mice with NF1, they're structurally normal. There are minimal learning and memory deficits in mice. There are very subtle deficits and defects in behavior. So are mice and rodents really a good model for studying it? And, and that prompted us to start to use human-induced pluripotent stem cell engineering uh, to study the uh, effect of NF mutation on brain development. Uh, I won't go through a lot of, about human-induced pluripotent stem cells, except that uh, they afford an opportunity for you to actually uh, personalize medicine because you can uh, obtain blood, skin, samples from a patient make their own uh, stem cells and that allows you to study uh, what the impact of their mutation is uh, on brain uh, development or heart development or any other tissue that you're interested in. What Michelle Begshai did in the laboratory was she was particularly interested in uh, differences in different uh, in patients with different mutations because one of the prevailing ideas at the time was the mutation that you were born with was not all that important that it didn't matter uh, that all uh, of the NF1 mutations led to a non-functioning NF1 gene and it wasn't really an important factor in determining uh, what kind of medical problems she, you would have. Michelle showed very nicely that in the human uh, mini brains, these organoids, that different mutations had created different defects um, in brain development, something that we never saw in mice. That allowed her to ask a question that we could never address in the mice, which is what is so unique about these patients with an NF1 microdeletion? So these are kids that we see that often have a facial dysmorphism. They have a high tumor burden and much increased risk of cancer. Uh, they have cardiac abnormalities, but they, in striking contrast to uh, those with intragenic gene deletions, they have 
uh, a severe intellectual disability with IQs typically below 70. These uh, total gene deletions take out not only the NF1 gene, but multiple genes, actually 13 genes in the neighborhood of the NF1 gene. So what uh, Michelle did with help from Karina Anastasiaki, an assistant professor here at WashU, is to collect now six different total gene deletion patients, something we can't really engineer well in mice, and ask what the impact of this mutation is. And she was able to show quite nicely that these, this particular mutation caused a severe interruption in the ability of the nerve cells to send out dendrites. And that uh, resulted in impaired neuronal function. She was able to narrow that down to a single gene within the NF1 total deletion uh, region, demonstrate that it was that gene alone that was responsible for the brain developmental defects uh, seen in, in NF1, and then go on to show that kids with NF1 who have a mutation in this gene are, have, tend to have a, a higher autism burden. And that was useful in uh, prompting studies to figure out just how this CRLF3 mutation works. And it works by impairing uh, the maturation of neurons uh, and their ability to function as neurons, and that's their ability to generate action potentials. So what we were able to do from those studies is begin to consider the germline mutation as an important factor for uh, future integration into our risk assessment algorithm. I'm going to build on that by telling you a second NF1 mutation story that not only helped us begin to collect more uh, DNA for uh, genetic testing, but also has prompted uh, a clinical trial by understanding what NF1 mutation does uh, for tumor development. So one of the unusual subset of patients that uh, develop NF1 are those that develop NF1 with this arginine 1809 missense mutation. It was, it's maybe about a half of a percent of all patients with NF1. And if you, what's truly striking about these patients is that they never develop tumors over their lifetime. They don't develop plexiform neurofibromas, and they don't develop optic pathway gliomas. That became an, an excellent opportunity for us to develop mice that have this arginine 1809 mutation. And when you do, you find that these mice, much like patients, do not develop optic gliomas. So all of the mice, when you examine their optic nerves, they just look like regular control mouse optic nerves. They do not develop optic leones. If you look at the nerve cells from these um, arginine 1809 mutant neurons, what you find is they are not excitable. They don't fire action potentials the way other NF1 mutations do. Uh, both on multi-electrode arrays and by calcium imaging. You can see that the typical NF1 mutant associated with tumors, those are perfectly able of increasing their firing rates, but those with this 1809 mutation do not. Karina then went on to ask whether or not you could repurpose drugs that we use to treat uh, excitability, that in particular uh, drugs for epilepsy and mood disorders uh, in children to see if we could block this neuronal hyperexcitability. And she found that it was only one class of drugs uh, that blocked 
uh, the excitability and the production of a key molecule called midkine that's important for tumor development. And that is lamotrigine and rafidamide. Uh, lamotrigine is an uh, anti-epileptic drug that uh, most pediatric neurologists are very familiar with. It's a, it's a drug that we use commonly, safely um, in young children. It's well tolerated, and there's a wealth of clinical experience with it. What Karina showed is if you treat these uh, NF1 mutant neurons with lamotrigine, you can completely block their firing. Um, and if you treat mice uh, with optic gliomas with lamotrigine after the tumor is already formed, you can block the production of that factor, but you can most importantly uh, abrogate the growth of the tumor. So lamotrigine becomes an agent that we can use as chemotherapy to treat the growing tumors by blocking the ability of the neurons to nourish the tumors. The other way that we could use lamotrigine is as a preventative agent. So can, can you give it during tumor development or before there's an obvious tumor and ask whether it prevents the development of a tumor even as long as uh, multiple months after the treatment has stopped. And when you do that, lamotrigine is very effective at blocking the formation of a tumor, so preventing tumor development. Because we wanted to take this into clinical trial, what Karina and her colleagues did was use uh, doses that are even smaller than we use to treat uh, kids with epilepsy and show that those are very effective at blocking the growth of the tumor. And that this was true for another optic glioma mouse strain uh, that also has excitable neurons that if you treat uh, mice with lamotrigine, even at doses down to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, you can block tumor growth. Important for our kids, uh, we wanted to see whether or not lamotrigine had any effect on the thickness of the nerve fiber layer and indeed, these treatments normalized the nerve fiber layer to near normal levels uh, in both strains of mice, arguing that this might be a great drug to consider for clinical trial. And it is currently in final stages of approval um, as a clinical trial um, to prevent the need or, or delay the need for a definitive chemotherapy in children with NF1. This also raises the point that, that neurons can create set points for cancer penetrance and progression. So if you look at mutations in mice that lead to tumor formation, all of those uh, have are mutations uh, where the neurons are hyperexcitable. And those where the mice do not develop tumors, those mice still have all the other features of NF1, but their neurons are not excitable. So can we use this excitability as a indicator of who's most likely to, to develop an optic glioma? There are lots of questions that um, we're, we and others are still uh, working through trying to understand why learning disabilities are worse in boys with NF1, why do optic gliomas frequently stop growing on their own, and how can we uh, use that uh, knowledge and, and to design therapies to stop them from growing perhaps prematurely. We need to understand uh, how attention deficit is uh, manifest in kids with NF1 and why drugs like Ritalin work so well. Can we repurpose other drugs that uh, as uh, tumor therapies uh, over the next several years? Those are just some examples of the kinds of things that uh, you can address in the laboratory based on questions that we have in the clinic. And with that, I just want to stop and thank the group 
uh, for at Washington University, both uh, my lab group, our collaborators, uh, our, and uh, most importantly, our families, um, who really inspire us every day uh, to do the kind of research that will hopefully change the way we take care of them in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Kaufman. Any question? Uh, 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 Professor Kamen, uh, I uh, very interesting about your your the last uh, uh, study about the, the neuron activity affect the the the, the NA friend ready tumor growth. I have just uh, attended the, the WCN World Congress of Neurology last year and heard about uh, the that issue. Of, uh, uh, mentioned by the uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Winkler uh, from University of Heidelberg. Yeah, uh, he mentioned he can, has very, very some similar uh, results as yours, but he studied the the, the incurable gliomas and the, the link between the the, the neuron activity and uh, in transit and the, the glioma. Uh, so, uh, do you think the uh, other kind of the 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 anti drug might be useful? Uh, because I think that uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Winkler they use another one uh, to to get the effect, and uh, they also trying to do some uh, like the external. Uh, stimulation to 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 stop the tumor growth. What's your opinion about that? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Winkler and Dr. Michelle Manje at Stanford are uh, some of the original pioneers in this field uh, called cancer neuroscience, which is built on the idea that neurons can actually dictate tumor formation and growth. It's an area that we're we're very interested in. Um, I'll tell you, there are a couple of, um, of observations that we've made over the years that are relevant to what you're bringing up. One is that this, these retinal ganglion cells in the eye get their uh, signals from photoreceptors that are light sensitive. And one of the questions that we asked about uh, eight years ago was, if you don't activate those retinal ganglion cells through light exposure, could you prevent the tumors from forming altogether? And uh, in experiments we did with Michelle Manje's group uh, published several years ago, if you rear uh, optic glioma mice in the dark, you can completely block tumor development because the nerve cells are not active. We've gone on to try to figure out what the mechanism is, and it looks like we can interrupt the neuronal activity, much like um, you were mentioning that Frank Winkler has described uh, through, an, through other mechanisms, not uh, through lamotrigine. But it argues that, there, that light exposure um, is one way that you can activate the neurons and by finding ways to either filter out the light wavelength or um, to uh, diminish light exposure uh, may act on the neurons to um, suppress their tumor drive. The other is that we have found that Neurons secrete neurotransmitters, much like uh, Michelle and Frank Winkler have described. In those scenarios, there are different neurotransmitters that work on the low-grade tumors relative to the glioblastomas. Uh, in their work, it's mostly been 
uh, glutamate that uh, acts on glutamate receptors expressed in the tumor cells to, to uh, drive their growth. The uh, others have described acetylcholine receptors important for uh, diffuse midline gliomas. So I think we're still trying to figure out what all the neurotransmitters are that can dictate the different types of brain tumor growth in an area that uh, I would continue to stay tuned um, because I think it's going to be transformative in how we think about uh, brain tumor treatment. And then the last thing I'll say, which is not my work, but the work of uh, Sean Hervey Jumper at UCSF, is that tumors, especially the high-grade tumors uh, in folks without NF1, integrate into the normal neuronal networks. And so in beautiful studies that he did as a neurosurgeon, he, he can show that motor tasks um, that he can record in the tumor-bearing brain of humans in the operating room actually involve the firing of, of the tumor cells as uh, the patients uh, execute motor tasks. And it just argues that the more connected those tumors are to the neurons, uh, the less likely we're going to be able to, to successfully remove them without dramatically impairing the function of the people. Uh, and second, that maybe we need to start working on therapies that disconnect the tumors from the neurons uh, as, a, as an, an alternative approach uh, to a surgical uh, removal. Thank you. Uh, that's a very, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, this uh, uh, country from the, 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 the audience uh, from the Raza Hakim uh, from the university. Uh, he, he is asking, oh yeah, 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 you can talk. Yeah, please. Thank you, Prof. Gutman, uh, for the information. I'm just uh, curious because when the neurofibromatis type one, uh, actually, uh, they said it can be uh, caffeinated as the uh, symptoms, but I can I make uh, think about the how can uh, neurofibromatis become a, a skin spot like that? How yes. do the the pathway mm -hmm. mechanisms? So we've looked at this. Others have looked at it. It it's a little surprising. The surprising answer is if you uh, sample the uh, one of these cafe au lait macules and do genetic testing instead of them having um, only one copy of the nf1 gene mutated you have both copies as if they have a increased growth advantage just like a tumor would and so they tend to hyper proliferate increase their proliferation in response uh, uh, to um, stimulations that increase the number of melanocytes. So they don't have, we don't see them transform into melanoma, but, but they are the result of losing both copies of the NF1 gene. Is it at the end uh, some uh, patient so it become a melanoma at the end? They don't. Um, they don't. They don't. And it's not all that clear whether people with NF1 are at higher risk for melanoma. The literature is a little cloudy. There are some reports uh, that say that there's an increased incidence. When we've looked at it and others have looked at it, there just does not appear to be any difference in melanoma incidence in NF1 versus the general population. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Whitman.
Vou pensar aí. Hi, uh, hi, hi, David. Hi. hi. Um, uh, do, do you have a, any idea about uh, um, the increased incidence of breast cancer in any one patient? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, a number of groups have looked. What is very clear is that there is an increased incidence somewhere between six and eightfold that it is um, more common in younger women than uh, so we often now get a mammogram starting at age 30. What's not so clear is why. Uh, there are studies from groups looking at sporadic breast cancers uh, where there is an overrepresentation of NF1 mutations suggesting a link that there may all there is also some early data suggesting that the nf1 may interact with estrogen receptor uh, function maybe a link between estrogen and uh, estrogen and mitogen uh, signaling in mammary epithelial cells um, and there is another and there are groups that are trying to develop uh, small animal models for uh, NF1 breast cancer. Uh, only one uh, has been successful so far, and those are very early studies uh, uh, that they haven't reported the results yet. Other than the, there, other than these NF1 mutant, in this case, rats do develop uh, breast cancers. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any question uh, hi. about audience? Hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question. Please. Um, I was wondering if there are any um, uh, CSF or blood biomarkers for NF1, uh, NF type 1. And uh, is it important to uh, research on the biomarkers or the clinical features uh, themselves are enough for diagnosis? So uh, let's do the second question first. So the clinical features are usually enough for a diagnosis. Uh, the way that we handle it in our program is if a young child comes in and has multiple cafe LA spots, uh, we tell the parents that it is highly likely that that child has NF1 and that we will start to monitor them as if they have NF1, not documenting in the medical record until uh, they actually have a second feature. There are some families uh, who would prefer knowing early, uh, in which case we will send genetic testing uh, and, and confirm the diagnosis at, an, at a very early stage when there's just CAF-ALA spots. Uh, and in some instances, it's not clear whether it's NF1 or Legis syndrome, which is uh, related, um, but due to a mutation in the SPREAD1 gene. So we'll get comprehensive NF1, SPREAD1 testing to determine whether it's NF1 or SPREAD1, which both can present with cafe au lait macules. And then your first question was about biomarkers. So that's been a bit of a mixed bag so far. Uh, there haven't been any reliable markers of uh, tumor formation or tumor growth. Uh, what has started to emerge for malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors is work from Angela Hervey um, and Adil Chahuri 
uh, at Washington University using circulating uh, tumor DNA fragments. Uh, that uh, is very good at detecting tumors, bef tumor transformation uh, and progression much better than PET scan and uh, MRI. That's still in the investigation stage. Uh, so while the data is very uh, encouraging, uh, it's not in clinical practice. Thank you, Professor. Um, I have a, another question about prenatal testing. Um, is it uh, common to do prenatal testing in, clin in clinical setting? Uh, clinical testing f for you mean genetic testing or uh, prenatal testing, like to oh, screen, okay. if, yeah, to screen if the um, uh, the child will have uh, will carry the gene. Yeah, so those are conversations that we have um, with our families because we want to make sure that they are prepared to deal with the outcome. Some families will say, regardless of the prenatal test result, I'm not terminating the pregnancy, in which case it, it it's of less value to them uh, other than knowing it doesn't help us prepare better. Uh, and if they're not going to make any reproductive decision, uh, it may be worth not uh, going through the, the risk of prenatal testing. There are some families that are pretty dead set against carrying a baby to term uh, if the child has NF. Uh, we then send them to genetic counseling because that, uh, that, that is uh, necessary to explore further before uh, they undergo the testing. And there, there are some families uh, in, who have the means to do prenatal uh, implantation uh, uh, genetic testing. Uh, and though we only have a handful of, of those families who say, I, I only want to carry a child to term for religious, who does not have NF1, for religious ethical reasons, I will not terminate a pregnancy. And in that case, uh, the pre-implantation diagnosis uh, uh, and testing is used to only implant uh, fertilized eggs uh, from that couple that do not carry uh, the parent's germline mutation. Thank you, Professor. Any question? Okay. Uh, so uh, many thanks to Professor Gardman to keep uh, support our co our IGPN course. Yeah, uh, many many thanks, and uh, I I'm looking forward to see see you next year. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Sweet dreams. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet dreams. <Bye>, <laughs>